I'd like to introduce our very special guest today, Steve Kalinsky. Steve uh, founded New Mountain Capital some 25 years ago prior to founding New Mountain. Steve is the co-founder of the Leverage Buyout Group at Goldman Sachs and Co., where he helped execute over $3 billion in uh, of transactions for Goldman. He then joined Forsman Little & Co. as a general partner, where he helped uh, oversee seven private equity and debt partnerships totaling over $10 billion, and where Steve was also the most senior partner uh, of Forsman Little outside of the Forsman family. Steve received his BA in economics and political philosophy with high honors at, from the University of Michigan, and then received his MBA from Harvard Business School and his JD with honors, again, from Harvard Law School. And in addition, Steve has served as either chairman or director of numerous other corporations and philanthropies. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to uh, and honor to welcome the one and only Steve Klinsky. Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, good. Can you hear me, Mo? Yeah, perfect. Good. Thank thanks. You. Thanks for having me here. And uh, thanks for including me in this, uh, this group. Okay. So uh, really excited about this conversation. And maybe we could just start uh, going all the way back to your roots. You know, you're born in suburban... Uh, or into a family in suburban Detroit, grew up in a family that was, as I understand it, fairly ensconced in business. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that and more specifically how that shaped your worldview and prepared you for your ultimate career and maybe even interested you in uh, private equity generally. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I grew up in uh, the Detroit area of Michigan, uh, public school kid, as you said, went to University of Michigan, then got e out east for graduate schools. Uh, I come, like a, I understand a lot of your listeners do, I come from a family business background. My, my grandfather and grandmother had a store for 30 years uh, selling, you know, winter coats in Michigan. My dad and uncle built into a chain of shopping malls were starting to spread around uh, the country. And uh, so, you know, coming from a family business affects the way I invest today, affects the way we think about a lot of things. And uh, so I, I, a lot of people at my firm come from small family businesses, and I think it makes us better investors. And so when you started, when you got into this industry, you're, we're talking about early 80s, right? It's like nascent origins. And, and back then, there were like a tiny little fraction of the firms today, and the scope of assets of the whole industry was probably smaller than the next Blackstone Fund. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you got into the industry specifically and what you need yeah, perspective yeah. So, those early experiences conferred? Yeah, so I got through college very quickly. I finished college in two years in a semester because I took extra courses and APs and all that. And I went right into graduate school. So I may have been the youngest person at, at Harvard Business School. And then I went to the law school. The very first leverage buyout of a public company happened in 1979 when I was in graduate school. And KKR bought Hudai Industries off the stock market and it had never been done before. And I had no experience in any other industry. My highest paycheck before going to business school was $3 an hour. I was, you know, I, had, I worked in the family store selling coats. So uh, I wrote my graduate JD MBA thesis on going privates and all the legal and business issues around it. And, and I went to Goldman Sachs in 1981 and said, I want to be your leverage buyout expert. They said, we've never done a leverage buyout. You could be the leverage buyout expert. So it's like going to Silicon Valley the day transitions have been invented or you know, there was no competition. No one wanted to do it. Uh, I was in their merge department. I helped co-found their original private equity group. And I helped run Goldman's first ever proprietary investment in a buyout. It was a $12 million paper bag company that Goldman, and Goldman was like a law firm back then. People forget how much things have grown in the last 40 plus years. We put a half a million dollars of the partner's money into this thing. The two CEOs of Goldman Sachs were watching over my shoulder. The head of investment banking were watching over my shoulder. So, and yes, there were only, I got poached away in 1984 to join Forsman Little. At that point, there were only 20 private equity firms in the world. There are now 5,000. KKR was the giant of the industry with 400 million of assets under management. And Forsman was the second giant with 220 million of assets under management. There were the three founders, another guy and myself. And so I've seen it. I kind of seen the whole movie. I'm one of the longest, one of the earliest people who are still around because I got an early start. And so uh, let's dig into that a little bit. Like again, going from that uh, small handful of 20 firms to 5,000 plus today, um, lots of things have happened over the last 40 years. You've had this explosion, obviously, in the number of firms and the number of dollars. You've also had uh, a shift where we had 
when you came in, interest rates were at all time highs to ultimately all time lows. And obviously, um, so when you think about some of those massive changes to where we are today, how do you think investors should be thinking, viewing that evolution and allocating differently today as opposed, as opposed to uh, how they may have in your early days of your career? Yeah, I think that's a really great and fundamental question. So what I tell people is private equity has evolved from a form of finance into a form of business. In 1981, the other people should remember is that uh, in 1981, we were at the end of a, a 13 year period of stagflation that had started at the end of the Vietnam War in the late 60s. And so the 10 year treasury rate, I started work October 1, 1981. The highest interest rates in US history were the day before I started work. The 10 year treasury was 15.84% last day of September 81. The stock market was lower in 1981 than it had been in 1968. And stocks were trading at about six or eight times after tax on adjusted net income with a lot of inflation. So the original idea of private equity, which I think is totally evolved and is the original idea was risk creates return, leverage creates return. If you had 95 parts debt and five parts equity, and 10% inflation, your $5 could go to $15 in a year with no unit growth, with nothing. And then Volcker and Reagan broke the back of inflation and in, the market started to rise for the next 40 years, essentially. So that's, and it was, I would say, four investment bankers in a room borrowing as much money as they humanly could. And I was one of the four investment bankers. What's evolved, take, take and even force them a little when I left it, we were the second biggest firm in the world. We had only eight people working at the firm and more people flying the Gulfstream jets and the helicopters than working on the investments, which is why that, that firm isn't around anymore. My firm today has 250 people working at the firm. We employ 107,000 people at the companies we own. We would be 63 in the Fortune 500 if we were one single entity. And it's no longer about borrowing a ton of money and going away and hoping things work out. It's now about pick a safe, non-cyclical industry, preserve and protect the business like it's your family business, and then grow a safe base into a, into a new mountain in its industry. So now it's really a form of governance where we're not under 90-day public reporting. We can be totally rational, attract the best operating managers, be as close to the ground as a small family business shareholder would be, but with the skills and scale of a major organization and be better than either a faceless corporation or a family that doesn't have those same access to resources. So we're adding AI, we're redoing sales forces, we're doing add-on acquisitions, we're taking companies internationally, we're building database. I mean, it's, it's 20 different ways to build companies, but it's now a form of business, not a form of leverage. Yeah, I mean, I love I love that framework. You know, a form of uh, shifting from a form of finance to a form of business. Um, and I'd love maybe for you to dig in a little bit into what that means, businesses building businesses. And I, I mean, that was the topic of this conversation. But I also just for anybody that's not familiar with New Mountain, started it 25 years ago. You mentioned that you have several hundred employees and 107,000 employees at your portfolio companies. You've overseeing over $50 billion and have created over $85 billion of enterprise value. Like you must have done a whole lot of things, more things right than wrong. So maybe tell us like what, again, just dig a little deeper and what distinguishes your approach from that of your peers in the industry today and what that practically means shifting from a form of finance to a form of business. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I am proud of our long-term record. So we're in four asset classes, uh, private equity, strategic equity, which is not control. We have a big credit arm where we lend to other people in a net lease arm. In private equity, we've never had a bankruptcy or missed an interest payment in the history of our private equity effort. And as you mentioned, we're out, I think $87 billion of enterprise, enterprise value created for all shareholders. Uh, the way we do it is a very common sense method that we just try to execute on better year after year. The two big ideas are defensive growth and business building. So, you know, one of the great luxuries of private equity is I don't have to be selling winter coats in the malls of Michigan. I get to pick whatever industry I want. That's great. I, that I and the whole team here decides is the right place for the next five or 10 years. So we're not 
we don't have to figure out the old iron found when we inherited or you could always be in the best spaces. We go for non-cyclical growth areas like we're very big in life science supplies, healthcare IT to lower the cost of healthcare and raise the quality, must have databases. We have incredible infrastructure services now where we're upgrading the power grid, we're upgrading the water grid. It's those type of businesses where we're not betting on this cycle or that cycle. So if you start with a nice, safe company in a nice, safe industry at a reasonable price, then the question is, how much can you add value to that business? And that's where I talk. There's over 20 different ways to add value to businesses. So let me give just a couple of war stories just to try to bring it home Please. for the audience. So and I, you know. So one story, which people, I did an article for Harvard Business Review, because I've also been the chairman of the private equity industry, and I've been trying to get the message across. We're not pillaging businesses or we're not Michael Douglas on the giant cell phone on the beach, you know, the way people, you know, some senators think we are. So I wrote an article about a company that everyone can access just online. Uh, and it's a company called Blue Yonder, started as a boring little software company called Red Prairie. We turned it into the world's leading supply chain software company, added AI to it years ago. That's where the Blue Yonder name came from. New management, new sales strategy, new products, much better technology. Took it from 500 million to eight and a half billion and sold it to Panasonic. So that's, you know, and I try to lay it out in detail. There are ups and downs to it as a nine year build and that's in that Harvard Business Review article. Or last year, we sold a company people may have seen called Signify to CVS, even in a terrible stock market last year, it went from 500 million to 8 billion of value. And what happened there was we picked the thesis first and then find the company for the thesis. So one of our themes is if you can go into people's homes and keep them healthy, that lowers the cost of healthcare, better for the patient, raises mm -hmm. the quality. You know, if the diabetes patient takes their medicine, they don't end up in the ER room. There was no really good company doing that. We, we, we put two little businesses together from different owners, renamed it Signify, added the strategy, added the management, changed the back end and logistics so they could cover more homes in a day. And again, it became incredibly valuable to CVS when they wanted to pursue the same strategy. So it's, okay. it's, that it's, it's, it's a safe base with business building. It's not risk. And we haven't even used debt in many of our companies. We, only, we usually use four times debt to EBITD. That's a sweetener, not what private equity means anymore. Right. So maybe, you know, I, I uh, actually, that framework is very helpful in understanding you start with the thesis and then pursue the companies. And and again, everything that you've articulated in your philosophy makes sense. You know, defensive growth industries, acyclical, all weather, top down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, can we just maybe zero in on the actual origination process? And like, I know you'll look at a thousand companies a year and then approach 10. Well, what I'd love to just understand is what distinguishes those 10 from the other 990? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about, so we've had the same two questions at investment committee ever since the firm started. Whatever the year, whatever the industry, the team has to convince the entire firm. We include we, we have an open investment committee where the, you could be a first day associate, you're invited to be in the room to hear the discussion because you might have a key piece of data that you can warn us about or at least you're apprenticing. And we don't decide on one meeting with a two hour review. We're, we're all sitting together working out of one office. We have you know the biggest floor plates we could find in Manhattan. So we're, we're together constantly talking these things over months. But when it gets to the final investment review, there's two questions that the team has to convince the entire firm. Question one, is the investment safe? Should we make roughly a double, even if the macro economy goes bad, even if you know you have downturns and all that? It has to be a, a, approximately a safe double. But second, it has to have a real fighting plan to make a 30% gross rate of return or better. And I can't give you our returns because this is going to be, this could be a public access thing, but we're, we're, you know, I know we've, you're we've done well. I we, we've, across the board. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm we, we've familiar. done well, and and yeah. uh, so uh, hey. we're we're beating our targets and all that. So those are the questions. Now the and so a lot of it is must have services. You know, we don't do much. Most of what we do is business to business type stuff, but uh, like bio manufacturing supplies where you know we we know that space really well. We know the best products, and then it's improving the company that we're buying to 
could be their pricing, their sales force construction, their manufacturing locations, add-on acquisitions, new markets. So the, you know, we, like we just bought a company with 150 million of EBITD. We had 10 operating partners working on that investment along with seven private equity people on the day-to-day -day execution. And there's 300 million of point by point value creation ideas on that 150 million of base earnings. So if we achieve them all, we'll own it for six times EBITDA before even the growth starts. Yeah. And so it's not, oh, wow, interest rates were up or down by 25 basis points. It's here's the value creation plan. And when you go to committee and you say, this is our plan for the business. This is how we know the space. Like in life sciences, we had a company called the Vontor that we built from 290 million to 20 billion. It's a Fortune 500 company today. We've done, that's in life science applies. We've done six or seven other deals in that space. So when the team comes back and says, here's our value creation plan for this one, and we examine it for months and question every question we can make, those are the criteria. And the sourcing comes from, we now have 12 sectors staffed up with 25 subsectors. So like we have a life sciences supply team that's scanning hundreds of companies waiting for one to be for sale, or we think the founder may be open to a bid this year and we'll approach him. I mean, but it's not like we're waiting for the banker to say, oh, you should study this industry. Right. Um, and, and so we're constantly scanning. Uh, and then the way our four asset classes work is, let's say we find a great business, we want to buy control and the founder says, we love you, we love your ideas, but I only want to sell you 30% as a convertible preferred. We used to have to say no. Now we have a bucket to do that called strategic equity. Or if he says, oh, I love you guys. You, you know, we agree as a wonderful business, but he doesn't want to sell equity. He wants a loan. We use the same analytical team that thought about buying the company to say it's a good loan. And we have a whole loan execution team. Or we could lease him his own building back for 20 years and get great yield and tax depreciation. So it's all, but it's all working off of this central analytical of good industries adding value to those businesses. Is there anything uh, unique? I mean, I think that that parameter at your investment committee level, which is, you know, worst case scenario, we're a 2x base case, we're looking for 30 plus IRR. Um, you know, that requires both figuring out the opportunistic sort of, again, business case, and then the, the other is like really handicapping what's frothy, what's risky. Is there anything unique that you would be, that New Mountain or your team would be doing there versus uh, your peers? Well, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's unique, but a couple of things we've always said. And when I say two times, I'm given approximations, you know, roughly. Yeah, yeah, I, understand. I don't want to be, you know, uh, overly precise. Uh, two things. One, we always try to tie it back to DCF valuation as well. And I, I encourage everyone to do that. We train our people from this from day one. We don't say, oh, you know, the market is paying 87 times for this type of company. So 86 times is a great deal because the market could be crazy as it periodically is. Similarly, when things drop super cheap, like we entered credit in 2008 after Lehman went bankrupt because the market oversold things, you know. So we try to have a fundamental DCF valuation mindset if there was no market comps at all. And when we look at market comps, we don't just look at current market comps. We go back for as many years as we can. You know, how did it trade in 2009, this industry? Right. If something's at 19 times EBITDA in 2021, but it had usually been at 10, you don't just say, well, it's at 19 times. You go, well, it's, you know, it may be 10 again. And the DCF indicates 15. So we're buying it for a 10. It's a good deal. You know, so anyways, it's, we, we don't just look at the current stock market. So Obviously, and I, you know, we're not a unic we weren't a unicorn buyer. I also can't buy art. I can't buy sports teams. A lot of things that go up in value, I do not know how to buy because right. I got to see cash in and cash out. I, I can't buy, you know, Picassos or something. I don't know how to think about them. I only know how to think about cash in and cash out in business. Yeah, and and so um, uh, other question I just want to get again because I think that obviously you you know we talked about the fact you guys have had top court sale performance. Um, and obviously, as you're starting from a smaller base, it's a little bit more tenable to do that. As the size of the firm grows, and typically that introduces potential challenges for su sustaining uh, that kind of performance going forward. How are you thinking about that? How are you navigating that? And also the competitive yeah. dynamics in the industry getting more yeah. se uh, severe. 
Yeah. So the way to think about fund size, I think you have to tie it to the talent at the fund. If, if, a, if a firm is four people and they never add a fifth and they just try to do bigger and bigger deals so they can you know, raise a bigger fund, that could be a recipe for disaster. If four people have, have carefully grown to eight people and they're doing one more deal a year, you may have much better talent per dollar than you had even at the larger. So if you, if you look at my own firm, again, I, when I broke off of Forceman Little, I had to go, Forceman Little had eight people. And, I, I, and so I had to go off and break off on my own in a rental office with a temp secretary. Now we're 250 people and 107,000 people in the field. We have much, so people say, when was the firm weakest? I say, well, when, I, when, when it was me, that's yeah. when you don't want to invest in the firm, you know? So it's the quality of the team and the talent per dollar ratio. Right. Also, it's how you set up the team. So like everyone in my firm gets equity in every deal from the reception sent up. It's not an eat what you kill culture. Mm. Of my team members, 20 are, are the team leaders. You would think of as the deal partners, but they've almost all grown up from first day associate or first day VP over the last 25 years. So like my president of private equity has been with me for 24 years. He's an absolute superstar by any acknowledgement. He's still in his mid forties. And the people behind him who are stars have been around for 20 years and they're in their early forties with great years in front of them. We've wow. laterally added 40 more, 40 or more operating partners on the team count. And we have over 50 others that we don't put in the team count because we only use them for, we call them the executive advisory committee and we use them for projects where it's their industry knowledge. And as far as the, the competitive environment, you know, we haven't bought one company in the sealed bid auction where we're just bidding our own fears. What we do is over half the time we find the company before it's for sale, because if you know the sector you want and you've spent years scanning every company in the sector, you can approach people proactively. You're not waiting for the banker. You're reaching out to the founders and the, you know, the, the, the owners of the companies. 85% of the time when we buy something, the seller is keeping some equity in the deal after we buy it. So they're thinking at two bites at the apple, the price today versus what the company is going to be worth in the future. And we have a great track record. Nothing's ever gone bankrupt. We've added all this value. We have a plan to build their business. So we want to become identified as the firm they wish would buy their company. Hmm. Like if they say at the same price, I would love to sell it to New Mountain because I know they'll do the best job. They'll keep it safe. They'll build it. And then we let them do price discovery. If it's not a total one off, we let them check out what other people are roughly at. And if they tell us and if we can match it, we go, great. But we're not bidding our own fears and we're not just paying the highest price we can stand to pay. We're paying the price that that they think is fair, that we, we think we can make our returns on. And they choose us. And again, we're only, some companies go for absolute auctions and they don't care about us and we don't buy them. You know, they, if the buyer was drunk and crazy, they would go, great, I'll get a higher price from a drunk buyer. That's great. But the ones we're in are more relationship acquisitions. And uh, even though they may be retiring, it's not that they're running the business. We have control. But, you know, even as you're retiring, you want to see your business in the right hands. You want to keep some stock. It's, it's that sort of a thing. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and obviously, like you mentioned that you start with the sector and then ultimately drill down to the companies you want. So maybe if we could just touch on the, sort of the macro picture, what, what sectors are you most excited about today? Why? Like, where's the puck going versus where it's been? Yeah. So, again, we, we have 12 sectors, like having 12 kids, we love them all. And one could produce two deals and nothing again for a year and or it could be 12 you know, they can each produce a, a deal next month. You never know. They're, they're all like good fishing holes that we're actively fishing. Some of the places we've done really great in and that I, I are particularly good at the moment, we've done extremely well in infra services. So not the low return, you know, windmill at 6% return, but all the tech services are out, keep upgrading the power grid, upgrading the water grid, keeping things in operation where there is technology to make you the best field service and picks and shovels providers. So, you know, we have a company called Qualys that's designing the power grid as we're running out of electricity. We have a company called Inframark that, that manages water utilities for local municipalities. We have a company called Assuria that can fix water pipes without tearing up the street with a special resin that builds the pipes from the inside out, you know, those type of businesses. Uh, 
I, again, we're, we do really well in, in things that lower the cost of healthcare and raise the quality of healthcare, like Signify was that. We help cure billing errors. We don't want to be the doctor delivering the care, but we, there's billions and billions and billions of errors and waste and mismanagement and so many niches where you can just improve the, the healthcare system with better technology and management. We bought two accounting firms, but we just bought a company called Grant Thornton that some of your uh, listeners might know. We bought a company called Citroen Cooperman in the previous fund. And just how that worked, like with Citroen Cooperman, there's a guy named Joel Cooperman at Citroen Cooperman. We talked to him for eight years before he was ready to sell the firm. But it's a great sector because there's more and more type of advice that your accounting firm could give you if it was added in. You can use technology to run the, the firm more efficiently. There's, you know, so there's lots of great things to do in that space. And we were one of the first movers there. Uh, giant databases, like we have the biggest consumer purchase database. We just bought a company called BMI that represents Taylor Swift and 1.4 million other songwriters, not to write their songs, but to collect their royalties for them. We're the, like if Spotify wants to play a song by any of these 1.4 million people, they have to negotiate with BMI, pay us the money, and then we allocate it back to the songwriters. So, I mean, it's 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 must-have services where we can add technology and improve things. And, and how does the like the sort of broader macroeconomic considerations play into your strategies? And maybe how are you seeing that today? Or what, yeah, so the, the first thing about being around for a long time is, I I lived through the '87 crash, the 88 recession, the 90 end of Drexel and junk bonds, the Russian crash. The so even when times are good, you know they're going to be bad in the future. So we don't get too excited. When I, when I started my first year at Goldman Sachs, there was a great old CEO named John Weinberg who was kind of legendary. And at the end of the year, he would say, you guys who are feeling good, don't feel so good. You guys who are feeling bad, don't feel so bad. You know. So we try to be very level-headed, all-weather, non-cyclical and we pick spaces. So we don't want to be buffeted. We try to avoid the macro economy. It's like the sort of businesses I described, there's just fundamental reasons why the power grid is going to meet, need to be upgraded for years to come. It's not like luxury auto sales that could go up or down or something. And that's true of all the sort of businesses I described to you. Uh, so, but I, I mean, I have amateur views of the economy and I think we've been pretty accurate. You know, every, every, every annual meeting, I have to kind of tell what I think, but uh, we don't depend on that. Right. Um, so maybe I'll skip the amateur views for now. I'll come back to them uh, if there's time. Very but, smart. Good thing to skip. <laughs> but I, I do think, again, you mentioned you have several businesses, one of which is a credit business. Yeah. And you've talked a, a bit about, you know, sort of within the portfolio companies, never having missed an interest payment or experience yeah. in default. And so what we're seeing, and I think you would agree, is uh, liquidity getting tighter, credit problems starting to emerge the macro does need a little bit of consideration there. So how are you thinking about that side of the business? What precautions are you taking? How do you see credit markets performing differently than equity markets? Yeah. Anything you want to tackle there? Yeah. So uh, again, just to put some context, we entered credit in 2008 after Lehman went down. Where we originally did it as a private equity line item where you know, we're trying to make 30% or better returns. We could... Things were so cheap. First lien of the safest little buyouts was 60 cents on the dollar, and we could beat 30% returns just holding it to maturity. So we started that way. That went very well. We then took the whole business public. It's on NASDAQ as a one of the major BDCs called New Mountain Finance Company. So any of your listeners uh, can check out the earnings and the loss rates, and NMFC is the ticker symbol. Uh, it's all public. I believe what the public information shows is we've had four or five basis points of default loss ever since we went public in 11. So, uh, and we have private versions uh, that we do for institutions at the same time and, and families. It's I, the way we play credit, I think is very, very good. And, I, and remember, I'm a big investor myself in all of our products. I am a family office as well as an executive at New Mountain. And so I only do products that I want to have a lot of my own family's money in. The way we do credit, for example, Let's say it's a great software company that someone is going to buy for 20 times EBITDA. Uh, we understand that industry very well. We've owned a lot of great software businesses. We may not want to outbid them at 21 times EBITDA, but we're very comfortable earning lending the first six clicks of debt with 14 parts of equity underneath us. 
our loan to value in our book is, I believe, under 40 percent loan to value in great high quality businesses. And if we ever own them, if someone said you own it for six times, we bought it for 20, you, you own it for six or seven. That would be a happy day for us. We would own it like a private equity company and be thrilled about it. So our loan to value is quite low. Credit in general, people keep waiting for the credit to explode. There's much more equity in deals today than it used to be even in 2008. And so let's say you had a business with 500 million of debt and a billion of equity underneath and interest rates go up by a percent. You know, that's five million of extra expense. You're not going to throw away your billion dollars because right. of the change in the interest rate. Sponsors are putting more money in or they're going to preferred investors and saying, put a click of preferred in and pay the debt down or help us. You know, so there's like even in our loan book, the defaults have been extremely low and the borrowers have put five billion dollars into the things we've lent to to improve the capital structure as they. So, I mean, it, it is not the 95 parts debt, five parts equity of 1981. It's right. a different industry and it also makes it better to lend to it. Now you gotta lend to the right, if you're in a terrible toy store company or something, you're still in trouble, but in a good sector where you understand the business at a low loan to value with good sponsors, I think it's a good business. Are you, um, are you worried at all about some of the knock-on effects of uh, trouble in real estate? particularly commercial real estate and other sectors that may constrain the amount of available credit as we go forward? Uh, you know, so we, we play real estate in one way, which I, I think is very good. So let me explain that. And then I'll talk about real estate more generally. Mm -hmm. We have what we call net lease, which is a net, you can think of it as a yield product or a real estate product. But if a company, let's say they have, they're a food company with one cold storage warehouse that they depend on we will sell it, lease it back to them for you know, 15 years with rent escalators every year. Uh, we, do a, we understand the credit of the company. We try to lend to good companies. If they went bankrupt, this would be the one asset they would wanna to save to come out of bankruptcy. Uh -huh. And if they vanish from the face of the earth, we're collateralized because we own the cold storage warehouse, which is, we think more than you know, what we paid for it anyway. So it's had very good downside safety, very good cash yield, tax shelter from depreciation and rising over time with rent escalators. So that continues to be a very good sector. I'm not in real estate beyond that. I do talk to Blackstone and folks who are. The, the, the reading I have is, you know, obviously the big pain point is office buildings, particularly B grade B office buildings, data centers, logistics centers, a lot of other things are doing just fine. And you know, I think where the pain point is going to be are the regional banks who have made the loan. I would hate to be an office borrower from a regional bank, or I don't know what's in their book. As non-bank lenders, you know, as the banking sector has pulled in its horns because of all their problems, we're the, we're the alternative that sails on without government bailout, without help. And, you know, so non-bank lenders don't have bank runs like Silicon Valley Bank did, don't have all the same issues. Uh, right. And it's a better market for us than ever. But, you know, I'm not in real estate as a general investor in real estate. Right, right, right. And and the part of your big credit business, the BDC that trades publicly, yeah. could you maybe talk a little bit about why you have that, what advantage it offers or what risks it introduces distinctly from a closed end vehicle? Yeah. So we have, again, it's a new mountain finance company. It's what's called a BDC, like Aries is that or... There's you know, some other big ones. Uh, the advantage is as a BDC, the way it works is we make loans to all sorts of you know, high quality sponsors deals. As we collect the interest, you pass it right through out to the shareholders. So there's no tax. You just kind of collect the interest and pass it out to the shareholders. Like a REIT kind of. It's like a REIT. It's exactly yeah. like a REIT, except they pay way more than REITs. And I never understand why REITs pay so little and we pay so much. I think the market, I, I think there's a disconnect about why people are in REITs and not us. But it's been, you know, you can look back, we've we've been 10% plus, even when interest rates were zero or one, it's mm -hmm. now more 11, 12, 13 type returns. And this is of other good BDCs as well, paid out in cash quarterly. So you're not trying to get appreciation on the stock. You're trying to, you're, you're going for the cash yield. So let's say you're an endowment with no taxes or you have a tax-free charity fund, or you just want high yield and pay your share of taxes. It's a great, yield 
vehicle. And it gets all down to credit selection. And we think if you're in non-cyclical industries that you really understand at low loan to value, you can do just fine. So now, and then we have private versions. The advantage of the public version is you have full liquidity you can get in and out whenever you want. You have, you know, like any other stock. Uh, the, the disadvantage of a public one is that you have more volatility around the stock price. So when COVID hit, even though we didn't have any defaults, we had a terrible week of trading the day COVID hit, you know, right. and then we kind of went back to normal over time. If on a private one, you know, you're just marking it to the performance of the loans and it's very, it doesn't have the volatility. Right. Any, anything, um, uh, or maybe just more broadly speaking, what keeps you up at night? So, uh, you know, we, we try to be as all weather sleep as well at night as any fund out there that I can imagine. Uh, I would like there not to be nuclear war. I would like to not have a worse version of a plague show up and wipe us all out. I would like the government to be nicer to private equity. One of the reasons I keep talking about what private equity is today and explaining is so that, you know, that people don't think we're pirates and, you know, knock us off the ship or something, not understanding we're actually building businesses. So I, I you know, I don't like our, our public image. Uh, but uh, I, I've never felt better about my own firm in this situation because people say, you know, my investors say, Steve, does your life get tougher as the firm gets bigger? I say, my life gets easier because like, you know, 2001, the copy machine broke. I got nobody to talk to. I can't fix the copy machine. Now, any issue of any type, I got this expert that, you know, that's what's good about building a team of incredible experts, you know. Right. So right. Uh, I've never felt better. And, and I think, you know, from your your listeners, when they think about a private equity firm, they should think of it as a business. What is the operating talent? What is their strategy? What is their culture? It's not a levered index on a, on a set of assets at a specific, it's like, you know, restaurants. What does restaurant food taste like? Well, who's the chef? What is their menu? What do they do? All restaurants are not the same. All private equity is not the same. It's a business, you know? And, and so I've never felt better about the people around me and the sectors we're in, our knowledge of the sectors. And also we're desperately trying to get better every year. We have a continuous mindset culture, improvement culture. People say, who do you compete against? I say, we compete against New Mountain last year. You know, how, how can we be better next year than we are this year? And we're constantly searching for any way to improve. So maybe just, and I know you mentioned earlier, first of all, you, you've obviously talked about having a pretty distributed leadership team keeping them all engaged, aligned. You talked about the carry being distributed to everybody. Is there anything else that you do differently in the hiring process or retaining the best talent um, that kind of gives you a competitive edge? Well, let me say this. We take the hiring and the retention as exceptionally important. So like, and there, and there's two ways you hire. You hire at the associate level and then you hire laterally occasionally at the senior level yeah. at the associate level we are out months in advance of when the recruiting season starts trying to identify who the best talent would be make sure they come and talk to us when it's time to start recruiting i actually started this year for the last two years we don't hire people out of college they put me on this giant zoom with like 500 college kids who want to be in private equity three years later and I'm happy to do it because we just, you know, wanted to be thinking about us all the way through. And when we hire somebody, not only do we have, you know, the recruiting team, I meet all the candidates before they're hired. The other senior people here, we meet everybody before they're hired. I, we, we're all mixed in together on one or basically one floor for private equity. I have breakfast with the associates every month and tell them exactly what I'm working on. They go around the table what they're working on. We're all within yards of each other. We line up for lunch four days a week where we bring lunch in and we and the secretaries line up to get it. So it's that sort of a culture. And then the lateral hires, you know, you figure out exactly what you need and you try to find the best expert in the world. So <laughs> we have like the recent hires we did in the last year. One is one of the top AI guys in the world who started McKinsey Quantum Black, started a company called uh, uh, Data Site that he did himself. Uh, we have full-time people in India watching over our workforces there. We have people who are experts in Salesforce construction, financial planning and analysis, cybersecurity. I mean, you know, you add the skills you need and it's not one, you know, they talk to 30 people here before we, we hire them. So, and the retention has been super high. And you, um, 
And you, you said earlier, I think you phrased it as private equity is a form of governance. Um, you know, where and how could LPs distinguish good governance from bad governance? You were also mentioned earlier that like, you know, it's focusing on the business. What does that look like? And and how do the limited timeframes of where all of a sudden a private equity invests and you want to get out in five years, how does that play into it? How does the new trend of continuation vehicles and other creative strategies play into it? Could you just talk a little bit about time horizons, good governance, uh, what have you learned and what should LPs be paying attention to? Yeah, so let me talk. So on, uh, on governance, what I was first trying to distinguish is the advantage a private equity firm has versus a little family business or a giant public corporation. Compared to a little family business, we have experts and skills and that we can draw on that a normal family can't have. We don't have you know, all the complexities of family issues and all that. Compared to the giant faceless company, we're not under 90 day reporting pressure. If it's gonna take us three years to turn you know, to lower margins today to raise them in the future, if we think it's smart, and the management thinks it's smart, we can do it. We don't have to go convince people. We don't have to worry about the stock moving up and down every day. We don't have the board of directors who supposedly runs the company, but is only there occasionally for shareholders they never met. It's just a much cleaner system. And what you're seeing more and more is, you know, the top operating managers are leaving public companies to come to private equity because they get more ownership in the business with us. They're in a rational professional context, which is easier than being buffeted by all the public stuff. So that's our advantage versus other forms. Within private equity itself, I would say what good governance means is number one, do they think about private equity as business building? There are some people who say risk creates return, things go bankrupt all the time. Uh, I let you know I leave management alone and I'm buying my car this weekend and I'm not worried about it. That's a different mindset that, you know, that's a and in certain cycles, you can do great that way. So what do they have a business building mindset? Do they have a culture where it's not this silo fighting that silo or this guy spiking that person? Or, you know, are they aligned? Uh, are they adding the right skills? Are they raising people up? Are they getting the, you know, I think, I think there's an advantage to having a wisdom of a very smart crowd around the table. And then I have to agree with the final decision. So if I thought it was a terrible idea, I'd keep asking questions until we figure it out. But uh, it's not me in a room alone saying, this is what we're going to do today. I, I, I try not to talk at all. You know, so there's there's just good governance and good management techniques that it's a business. You know, it's like we have all sorts. I could talk about any aspect of our business at length, but it's yeah. not just by talking to a banker and borrowing money. And so, I mean, a lot of people are often defined, you know, in other words, their ability to make good decisions in the future or as a result of poor decisions in the past. When you uh, think about the deals that have been most instructive or said another way, you know, the most transformative challenges or uh, mistakes they may maybe made in the past that shaped your philosophy and approach, what comes to mind? Uh, so again, not what we haven't had too many bad mistakes because we've never had a bankruptcy or mistress in, miss interest payment. Uh, the formative experiences, I've had all sorts of formative experiences. Uh, growing up in a family business, my dad is the guy I most admire in the world. I admire my family. So I grew up in that culture. Goldman Sachs in 1981, we would all sit around the table in the merger department and what are things worth? Everything was worth 10 times net income. It's always 10, then it was 10 times EBIT, then 10 times EBITD, then 10 times revenue. And But anyways, I, you know, so that was the Goldman culture was great. Forsman Little, had a weird kind of dysfunctional culture, but the investments were incredible and it was very glamorous and fun. And, you know, Ted was dating Lady Di and we own Gulfstream Jet and stuff. So it's not a reproducible culture, but the idea, you know, of, hey, they had a great safety record when I was there and the, they, they lost it later, but we didn't have any, you know, great safety record build businesses was something that emerged at Forceman Little. And I've tried to take it to the next level uh, you know, and we have had challenges in some of our companies, and we then just try to improve the processes, fight through it, put more resources in and improve the process so it never happens again. And, um, you know, so we're always trying to get better. And you learn from your successes, too. They, they say you don't only learn from failure. Sometimes you go, well, that's a good niche. And we know more about that industry than ever. And now the customers are our friends and we can sell more to them. So you learn both ways. Huh. Interesting. Um 
And, uh, you know, I, I mean, one thing that you've actually criticized is because I think what, what is happening is the, the question that a lot of LPs are asking is, are we seeing the betafication of uh, private markets, you know, as more and more participants come in? And, you know, in, in the academic parlance, you know, they talk about this in the form of efficient markets. Um, how do you think about market efficiency, market dynamics, uh, and, and alpha generation within that context? Any thoughts that you have there? Yeah. I mean, the reason I like private markets versus public, I find public markets incredibly difficult. Do not know how to beat the public market. You know, private markets are totally different. You pick your space. So you get to pick your industry. You pick your management. You pick your strategy. You add every resource to it. You pick your date of exit. So you can, you know, when the people want to pay high prices is the year you sell. You have, you have so many levers. So I, I really, I've objected publicly. That there's a blind concept everyone learns. I went to business school. A lot of your listeners went to business school. Risk creates return or risk and return go together. That assumes a casino passive context where there no skill could be added. Like, you know, I'm playing the roulette wheel. If I go into the boxing ring with the world heavyweight champ, I will have all the risk and he will have all the return because he's a really good boxer and he has skill. So risk and return do not at all go together if there's skill. And the whole thing about private equity is you own the company and you can use skill to build the business. And I remember having a debate. There was a guy I tried to hire and he went to a, a hedge fund. And I said, do you want to be the bookie in the stands or do you want to be the player on the field? Don't you want to be the place? He said, no, I'd rather be the bookie in the stands. I go, why is that? He says, well, as a bookie in the stands, you know, it's easy. You, know, you can just make your bets. You don't have to go labor. So, I mean, it is labor. You got it. But there's a pride in actually owning the business, working with it, building it. Those are the people we recruit. That's what we're proud of. And it's a different, it's a totally different job than picking, you know, trying to think what the market's going to do next and out guessing the market. I mean, you know, we own these things. So right. again, I'll go back to restaurants. There may be a beta for all restaurants, but if you're La Bernadette, and I, I'm, I can't cook anything, but if you're a brilliant chef with a brilliant, you know, you'll be a good restaurant. Hmm. So and now let's, no talk a little, let's talk a little bit about your own cooking and also your own consumption of that cooking. Yeah. You, know, you, you mentioned earlier that, I mean, obviously you've created great wealth for yourself and that you're, you yourself are investing your own capital. How are you allocating your own capital today, maybe even within your own vehicles, where where and how are you thinking about that, or perhaps more broadly? And and I think that's going to also, say, I would love to hear your thoughts on how, um, how you're thinking about it in the context of your family specifically. So look, every business that New Mountain does, you know, I have to believe in it as an investor as well, because I am a very significant investor with my family in all of these projects. And so are other people at the firm. And like, I think I can say this, you know, and our, we're about to close our, our newest fund, Fund 7. Uh, you'll be reading about it soon because we put out a press release soon. But we're going to have $1.4 billion of GP capital in that fund, which was twice what we promised the LPs when we started the fundraise. And, you know, I'll be very significant. Other people will, too. And our people who are investing in it, we don't say if you want one percent of the carry, you better put up one percent of the money. It's totally optional. And, you know, a lot of these people are still buying their first house with their young kids at home. They just, you know, they believe in the firm because the returns are so good. If you look at New Mountain Finance Company, which trades publicly, we're the biggest shareholders of that. And never, mm -hmm. I've never sold a share of that. So and I believe in net lease. I believe in strategic equity. So, you know, uh, we we we. Uh, and it's a great luxury when I get calls from the high net worth guys at the banks. Do you want to be in this fund or that fund? I go, no, I got New Mountain. Why, why do I, I don't want to hear these other pitches, you know, because I know my own stuff and I believe in it. But uh, so and, and we're just out. We're, we're just a significant piece of everything we do. Well, so let me ask you a question a different way. First of yeah. all, I'd love to hear just in terms of how you're thinking about capital allocation, even within your own vehicles. That's number one. Yeah. But I think yeah. even more, more specifically, you also interact with lots of limited partners and uh, what separates the exceptional investors or limited partners from the mediocre or worse limited partners yeah. encountered? Well, look, let me say this. I think picking, I think a limited partner picking a, the right GPs is a very high skilled, high talent 
business. It's, it's, it's like our, we picking companies is a lot of skill. Picking the right GP is a very skill-based business. The good ones are, I think, focus on the questions I talked about. It's not like the, the worst thing is, well, will they give me a fee cut? I mean, you know, I can go to the worst restaurant in New York with tomain poison and get 25 cents off the tuna sandwich. That may have been the worst purchase in my life. Or I used to coach Little League, and I, I told somebody once, my Little League players play for a lot less than the Yankees play <laughs> for, but you know, the Yankees are a better team, you know? So, but what you should focus on is, what is the talent at the firm? How do they actually add value to businesses? How are they different from just the average firm? Avoid the beta, the betaification. And look, the average private equity firm has been the best asset class around, but it would, but the best private equity firms are way better than the, the, the alternatives. And it's, are they business builders? Do they have a good culture? Are they sustainable? How do they, you know, all the things I'm saying, because you can get lucky. Let's say your bet on oil prices going up as an energy fund or something. You might look good for five years and then you might look terrible for the next five years. So you need a you need to really understand how they're making their money in, in a very fundamental business analysis way. Yeah. So I want to ship that. I know we have only have maybe time for a couple more questions. I want to actually segue from uh with the little league analogy, because you've actually been involved with kids and education and children yeah. health charities, and you've been trying to improve the charter system and the public schools in the U.S. And you even, I, as far as I understand, it, you even took a year off to work in Harlem to launch the first ever charter school, uh, and of course, being very active in education reform. And if I am, if I if I have my facts correctly, you're now very active in making college education more accessible. Maybe just talk a little bit about the projects you're most excited about. Why do you believe they have such great impact? Um, well, thank you for the question. Let me say, first of all, even though you didn't ask it, I just want to, I, I believe private equity itself can be a very socially positive way of doing things. And I should say, you know, I went to law school as well as business school. If I was smart enough, I wanted to be a Supreme Court justice. And then my roommate was so smart, I said, I better go into business and get, get the heck out of law. Uh, but uh, I've always had a chip on my shoulder about is private equity you know, an appropriate way to live your life? So like ever since 08, we've put out a social dashboard that we update every year. We've added or created over 70,000 jobs, net of any job losses pay way more than the national average, over $8 billion of R&D software and capex, never a bankruptcy, never miss an interest payment, 87 billion of enterprise value gains. And we also just started tracking what workforces are making the companies we've sold just since 18, when we started tracking the numbers, made 1.3 billion, not counting the C-suite or the board, just regular people at these companies. So I'm proud of private equity. I think it's a very good way to live your life. I think like a lot of you probably think this way in your listeners, it's also good to try to live your life properly outside of your job, not, not in atonement for, but in addition to. Right. So like the, the, the things I'm most involved in, I did, as I was leaving Force Lolo to start New Mountain, I got very involved in ed reform and I had been involved in ed reform in other ways. I did start the first charter school in the state of New York. I'm the chair of Harvard's public education policy group. I said what you're referring to in college is I'm very proud. We set up something called modernstates.org that all your listeners can go to. Anyone with, a, with internet access can get a free year of college with credit at Michigan State, Ohio State, Texas State, because we give away courses online for free from college professors that tie to exams that give you credit from the college board and we pay for the exam. So if you have any neighbor, friend, third cousin, anybody's trying to save a year of college, tell them modernstates.org, it's free to everyone. We have 500,000 users, it's biggest in the country, it's still rolling out. Uh, I do. I just did with Johns Hopkins, their public institute in India, it's called the Gupta Klinsky Institute for Public Health in India. I do hospitals in Africa, all sorts of things, but it's not, because I think I'm guilty. I don't feel guilty about private equity. I'm proud of private equity and I'm trying to be a decent person. And, and why, why specifically is that funding that first year of college? Why is that so significant? Why do you feel that's so impactful? There's $1.7 trillion of student debt. College has gotten, as everyone knows, more and more and more expensive. So like even Purdue, where they're trying to keep tuition under control, it's 31,000 bucks for an in-state student. And they're the most cost conscious state university you're gonna find. So it's just such a simple idea. These exams have been around for 50 years called the CLEP exams. 
And like, if you look in the admissions catalog of any state school or community college, they say, if you pass the college algebra exam, you have college algebra done as you enter so that you can get like a year worth done before you enter and start as a sophomore. If you run out of money, you can finish with one course or whatever. So it was such an obvious idea that I felt compelled to like create the courses and pay for the exams because for a thousand bucks, I saved someone thirty one thousand dollars. Wow. You know, wow. and it's open to everybody. It's it's just the people who use it. Anyone of any background can use it. It's like if Abe Lincoln was reincarnated with not a penny in his pocket, he can get a year of college this way. And other foundations are supporting it. And it's, you know, and Purdue has made it a big special program of Purdue and stuff like that. So uh, yeah. it's just so obvious. You know. Yeah. So maybe I'll sneak in two quick last questions. Yeah. One, um, you mentioned earlier how much you admire your father or my new father and yep. uh, yep. um, but are there uh, any books or thinkers outside of your family that most shaped your worldview uh, all right well this this is now getting very private and personal but i will say on a on a philosophical point of view when i was a young guy at force Mudd, i was on a trip to london and i was a philosophy major undergrad and i picked up a book by martin buber the theologian on my way to london it was a 40 page book called the way of man incredibly impactful in my own thinking because basically to cut through it he says look you, the purpose of life is you got a job to do you live here you're supposed to make life better here where you stand now so that answered a lot of questions that was i thought that was a, i encourage people to read that book mm -hmm. uh, i read a ton of history so i have heroes in history that you know I, mean, I look at george washington or winston churchill or different people and go man look what they did and also you see people make mistakes and so I'm a big history fan. And one of the questions I always ask the new associates that I'm hiring them is, who do you most admire? Because by seeing who they most admire, you see the characteristic that they most care about in themselves. And so that's like one of my, I've given away my secret question now. If anybody applies <laughs> to yeah. as an associate, you're, I'm going to give you that question so you can get prepared. Oh, fantastic. Uh, yeah. and, and last question, maybe any parting words of advice for other family offices or intergenerational families with you know, intergenerational wealth transfers, anything that you've learned that you think might be useful uh, for them? I don't have any kind of general estate planning advice or something. I do think private equity, credit, all these alternative assets are a great class if you pick the right firm that's actually adding value, not just taking risk. And yeah. I think it's very worth people uh, studying it. Fantastic, Steve, that was great. Thank you so much for joining us, for sharing your incredible insights with us and just being so generous with your time and wisdom. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for having me. It's a privilege. Yeah. And so for all the participants, thank you for joining us. If you haven't yet donated, please do so with lunches uh, at withlegends.com. Uh, and to Steve and everyone else on the call, thank you again for your support and wishing each of you a wonderful day. Take care. <laughs>